Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Zwingli United Church of Christ on this beautiful, warm, sunny day. Yeah, okay, so glad that you are here. I'm glad that you're able to brave the snow and get out in the cold, and uh, very thankful you're here uh, today. I'd like to welcome everyone who's here, including any visitors. I invite you to pass along the welcome sheets that are at the end of your rows. Uh, fill those out and pass it to your neighbor. And also hope that everyone will join together afterwards in a time of fellowship. Um, and then followed by that with uh, Christian education, hope you'll participate in those activities as well. I want to uh, give a thank you to Harold Hunsicker and to the trustees and to the kids and to all those who are outside trying to shovel and get the parking lot ready for us uh, to be here this morning. So thank you to all who are involved with that. For those who are able, please stand for the call to worship. As we settle into this sacred place, we put away the pressures of the world. Silence the voices that demand perfection. We stand, uh, we stand before a God of compassion and welcome. justice, guide our hands and our hearts. As we live out your calling, walk with us and strengthen our spirits. May our eyes be opened and our lives be filled with newfound promise. Amen. And it is good for us to take a moment to reflect, to contemplate our shortcomings, those things we wish we had done better. And so, let us join together as we confess before each other and God. Merciful God, in baptism you promise forgiveness and new life, making us part of the body of Christ. We confess that we remain preoccupied with ourselves, separated from sisters and brothers in Christ. We cling to destructive habits, hold grudges, and show reluctance to welcome one another. We allow the past to hold us hostage. In your loving kindness, have mercy on us and free us from sin. Remind us of the promises you make in baptism so that we may rise to a new life and live together in grace. Our 
imperfections are well known to God. Yet in baptism, we are sealed and claimed as God's own. How can we deny God's grace? Friends, God is love, and in love, our sins are forgiven. Amen. gather this day to praise God, to praise Christ. We also gather this day in the peace of Christ. And so I say to you, the peace of Christ be with you. Also Let us share that peace with one another. That's it. All righty. So did you notice anything that you needed to walk around when you came up the aisle today? If you came up, yeah. Do you know what that is? Yeah, no. Is it? We use that when we baptize a baby. Yes. Do you see any babies here to be baptized today? No. Well, there's something else that we're going to do today. Today is a special day that we remember about promises. Have you ever made a promise? What kind of things do you promise? <coughs> to help clean up the room? Yes. Sometimes I promise if you let me stay up and watch one more show, I'll get up early in the morning. And that's really hard to keep that promise, isn't it? Yeah. Have you ever done a pinky promise? Yeah. When I thought about talking about pinky promises, I remembered that Pastor Butch has talked to you about pinky promises. And probably it was on this very Sunday last year, it might have been. Because today is a day that has a lot to do with promises. We're going to do the promises around baptism because when you were all baptized, your parents made promises about raising you to be in the church and know God and know God's love. And they're doing a pretty good job, aren't they? Yep, you're here, you're learning, you're growing in your faith. Good stuff. And so all, most, of, most of the folks out here have been baptized. And some, um, when we reach an age, there, there are people in confirmation right now. You get old enough, then you make those promises for yourself. But the best part of those promises are the promises that come from God. Because during that time, we are told about God's promise to love us, no matter what. I don't know if you were listening to the, to the prayer of confession we just did and the words of assurance, but a lot of what we've said already today is saying, oh man, sometimes we mess up. <clears throat> sometimes we try to, try to keep a promise and we, we forget or we can't quite do it. But God's promise is still there for us anyway. God keeps loving us and forgiving us and accepting us for who we are and encouraging us to keep trying to do better. The other promise that's going to be made this morning is there are a lot of people who are a very important part of our church. And some of those people are just now coming on committees or taking on roles. So there will be a time in our worship too when they are promising to do the work that they've been called to do here. And we are promising to support them and help them in doing that. So keep listening for promises today, okay? Because there's gonna be a lot going on. And if you're here, when we do our remember your baptism and be thankful, duck because, because the sprinkles of water might come your way to remind you of how much you're loved by God. Let's pray. 
Oh, gracious and loving God, what a joy it is to remember your promise of love for us <clears throat> and to be able to remind each other and especially these children of the magnitude, the, the extent, the huge amount of your love that is poured out on us. Your welcoming of us for who we are and your constant blessing of us to always keep trying to do better to share your love with those around us. Bless these children in all the ways that they grow in their love for you and each other. In Christ's name, amen. This morning we read our Hebrew lesson from the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, starting at verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed will not, he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness.
gospel lesson this morning is found in the gospel according to Luke in the third chapter and beginning with the 15th verse. And I'll read a little further into the 23rd verse. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Well, there's a Presbyterian minister and a Baptist minister who are discussing baptism. And the Presbyterian asked the Baptist if he considered a person baptized if he was immersed in water up to his waist. No, said the Baptist. Do you consider someone baptized if she is immersed in water up to her neck? Asked the Presbyterian. Again, the Baptist's answer was no. Well now, said the Presbyterian, suppose you immerse a person up to their eyebrows. Would you consider them baptized then? After the Baptist heard this, he was getting a little upset and said again, absolutely not. Well now, said the Presbyterian, suppose you um, immerse the person just a little above the eyebrows. What about that? No, said the Baptist. They are not baptized. Well then, there you have it, said the Presbyterian minister. It's only the little bit on top of the head that counts. Ah, <laughs> uh, I had to tell a baptism joke. I have several, but I'll leave it with that. Today we celebrate the baptism of Christ. And as you know, it's one of my favorite Sundays because we renew our baptismal vows. You're lucky that we are not Baptists this morning and you just get a little bit sprinkled on your head or where the water happens to fall instead of full immersion. Although some of you closest to the branches might feel like you're getting immersed. But I enjoy this uh, wonderful Sunday, not only because of the fun of it, but also because it is a Sunday where we are reminded again whose we are. That we in baptism are claimed by God as beloved daughters and sons. But baptism is not just something done to us. Our renewal of vows is not just something done to you. But it's a symbol of a relationship. It's a symbol of new life. It's a symbol of how we are to spend our lives together. And we also need to think about this day, how we are to live out our baptism whenever it happens. In the Baptist Church of my youth, we were indeed fully immersed in baptism, a symbol of dying to the old self and being raised to new life. It's a great symbol of new life in Christ. But that symbol was meaningless if you didn't live out your life as if it were filled with Christ's Spirit. You see, in the Baptist church, one has to make a profession of faith before you can be baptized. I did that when I was eight years old, as if I actually knew what it meant to profess my faith at the time. As I tell the confirmation youth, when I attended church back in the day, before I was baptized and afterwards, we went to Sunday school and morning worship. Then we returned for training union, a kind of evening Sunday school, and yet another worship service. And then midweek on Wednesday evenings, we had a prayer meeting. We did this every week, faithfully. So you would think that all that church would have prepared me at eight for being baptized. It didn't. You would have thought that that 
church and all that we did would have prepared me for life and faith at 16 or 26 or 46. It did. I'm still, as it says in the Philippians, or the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians, working out my salvation in fear and trembling. In our church, and in the UCC, we give witness to God's claim on our lives a little earlier in life, since we baptize infants. We also baptize youth and adults, just not by immersion. Just the top of the head is enough for us. Even though our practice is to baptize infants, we also have our own form of training for young people and adults. We also have Sunday school and Bible studies and more chances to learn about our faith and about what God means for our lives. We have mission opportunities that also immerse us if we take advantage of it and what it means to be a child of God. Some others spend time in reading the Bible and prayer each week and still others become part of a ministry team or help plan the Easter sunrise service. We also have, as Pastor Elaine said, confirmation, a two-year process at Zwingli United Church of Christ. Now, I'm not sure which form of baptism or preparation is best, but what I do know is that pre preparation is critical to a life of faith. One of the things that's fascinating to me about Jesus' life, especially as it's described in the Gospel according to Luke, is that we hear nothing about Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30. When Luke tells us, as we heard in Scripture this morning, he began his work. The last thing we had heard about Jesus before this was when he was 12 years old and in the temple, and his parents had to go back to Jerusalem to find him. And then we're told at the end of that story that Jesus increased in wisdom and in years, and in divine and human favor. But 18 years, 18 years, what happened in that time to Jesus? Did he work as a carpenter with his father? Did he struggle at all with life? When he begins his ministry, we do not know, or we know that Joseph did not seem to be around. So did Jesus and his family lose his father? We all know how that can affect a family, don't we? And in those days, not to have a father or a male head of the household meant lower in social and economic status. And so maybe Jesus did, and maybe his family did have some struggles, some bumps and bruises, some difficulties along the way. And this wisdom that Jesus gained, it didn't just happen. Wisdom is nurtured and cultivated and requires, I think, a few of those bumps and bruises and struggles with life along the way. For those of us who are people of faith, it requires prayer, it requires connection with others. It requires examples of wisdom from other people who are heroes in the faith for us. I believe it also requires humility, a love and concern for all people, a concern for mercy and justice, a firm grasp of how to discern the truth and to speak that truth in love. Like I said, I'm still working on it. How about you? Whatever happened with Jesus in those 18 years, it apparently was not enough preparation. Just after his baptism, he is led out into the wilderness where he is tempted and tested. More preparation for who he is called to be, what he is called to do. Then he seeks disciples who follow him and are themselves prepared. But Jesus is also being prepared in those three years for what is to come, for what God will do through him. You know, this is kind of comforting to me. I don't know if it's comforting to you or not to know that pre preparation can last a lifetime. That Jesus didn't just get it, that that was all the preparation he needed at age 12 or age 18 or age 30. That there was more to come. It's comforting for me to know that there is more for God to teach me and to teach us. To know that for each phase of our lives, whether it be something simple or something difficult, God will offer ways for us to grow in wisdom and faith.
today, as you've heard in the children's message, and as many of you know, because that's why you're here, we're installing ministry and council members today. Some are new to the task, while others have been at it for a year or two, while others still have had a lifetime of service in one way or another at this church. It would be really nice if God infused every one of us with the wisdom we needed and all the preparation in just like a split second so that we would know how to do what we've been called to do and all ran smoothly and easily. But for anyone who has been in the church or who has served in the church, we know that there are bumps and bruises and struggles along the way. Sometimes it even takes half a year or more for someone to even figure out what they're supposed to be doing on a particular ministry or committee. But whatever the struggle may be, many stick with it and see what they can learn and how they can best serve. They learn from mistakes. They learn from others they watch. They learn from the spirit that is within them. Sometimes that means staying with a particular ministry for six years or in some other ministry position. Or sometimes it means finding a new ministry where your gifts can be best used. All in all, I hope that whatever we do, I bet somehow what we do helps us to gain wisdom and favor and helps us to understand how best to be faithful as a people and as the church. So how are we being prepared? And how do we seek the preparation we need? How do we live out this baptism that we celebrate today and seek to work out our salvation in obedience to God? Do we avoid the hard stuff and just try to move on without gaining wisdom from our struggles? Or do we pray and connect with others and look for and learn from examples of wisdom from those who demonstrate deep faith? Do we listen and respond to God when we hear God's voice or deeply the Spirit of Christ? As I heard, as I listened this morning to the prayer requests, and as I heard about Martha, I came to understand even more deeply what this means to gain wisdom from others, to prepare ourselves, to make sure that we are immersing ourselves deeply in Christ's faith and faith in Christ. I came to understand more deeply about what it means to connect to others and to look for and learn from the example of wisdom and faith who, from people who in fact demonstrate that faith each and every day. And I hope that we are open to those people, to those stories, to those experiences, even when they're difficult and hard. Well, the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Wood tells a story about wisdom of faith, wisdom and faith, and I'd like to share that with you. He said a medical doctor once told him how he had fought against the idea of a personal God who intervened in human life. He instead sought refuge in music. Bach particularly appealed to him because of the mathematical precision of the fugues. Meanwhile, his life was falling apart. His wife had left him, he started drinking too much, and one day as he was driving, he pounded on the steering wheel with open palms and cried out, God, if you're really there, you're going to have to say something, and you know what kind of man I am. No screwing around now, no damn signs. You're going to have to talk my language. Just then, the radio came on, or the song that was played was Yezu, Joy of Man's Desiring. Lawrence Wood says, my friend sobbed and laughed at what an idiotic but wonderful word this was to him. And just in case he might try to explain away the moment, saying that Bach was often played on that radio station, even though it was a non-classical music station, the next song that came up was The Girl from Impambina. <laughs> it's amazing how God speaks to us. 
if we prepare ourselves to hear what God has to say. It's amazing how God speaks to us in those uncanny, unusual moments, telling us that we are beloved children of God. But we also know this morning that our call and our preparation does not end just there with God speaking to us or us being baptized at the font or feeling the sprinkles on our head or on our body. We know that our life in Christ does not end with the recognition just of our need. Yes, there are times when we may be able to get by with a few sprinkles of mercy and grace. But what the scripture calls us to this morning, what Christ calls us to this morning, is to fully immerse ourselves in the way of Christ as much as we possibly can. So that as you feel the water hit your face, this morning, or simply as the water comes near to you, because I know some of you duck and cover. <laughs> I ask that when that happens, to remember your baptism and what it means for your life. Remember your baptism and what it means for your faith. Remember your baptism and what it means for the church. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Dear friends, on this day of recreation, we recall Christ's baptism and we claim and remember our own. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. believe in God? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we gather this morning, we are thankful for your presence. We are thankful that you are with us each and every day. We are thankful that you sent Jesus into the world, that we might know life and know life abundantly, and that we might know how to serve you and your great ministry of reconciliation. Oh God, as we feel again the waters of baptism, as we renew our baptismal vows, as we think again and we and we reflect again on what it means to be baptized into the Christian faith. May you help us to open our hearts and minds and souls that we might receive your grace, not only now, but in the days ahead. For we know that we need your grace to get through the days ahead. We know that there are struggles along the way. We know, oh God, that you are always with us and that you will indeed show us the way that you will bring us together into your church, into your community, that you will help us, oh God, to be those who serve in the name of Christ. So as we feel these waters of baptism, O oh God, help us to remember that we are indeed your children, your people. Amen. Once we were no people. Now we are God's people. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. 
Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism and be, and thankful. be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remember your baptism and be thankful. Oh, this is so much fun. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Remember your baptism and be thankful. ritual. <laughs> who is ducking and covering even though they know what immersion is about <laughs> and another one who had their hands wide and ready. <laughs> Church of the United Church of Christ recognizes the diverse gifts of its members and celebrates the particular ministry of each person in the life of this church. These people have been called by God in accordance with the faith and order of this church to serve among us. They have thankfully accepted their call and are before us as witnesses to their willingness to serve. Sisters and brothers, I have to get way over here to talk to you. Sisters and brothers, it is an honor to be entrusted with the responsibility and particular service in the ministry of this church. And so having prayerfully considered the duties and responsibilities of your ministry, are you prepared to serve with the help of God in Christ's name for the glory of God? If so, please answer, I am. Do you promise to exercise your ministry diligently and faithfully, showing forth the love of Christ? If so, please answer, I do, relying on God's grace. I do, relying on God's grace. And members of this household of faith, you have heard the promises of our brothers and sisters in Christ who have answered God's call to service. Let us affirm our intention to live in covenant with Him. 
And so will those who are able please rise as we witness to the commitment we now make. We gather in celebration of the joy that is ours to be partners with you in the service of Jesus Christ. We promise to love you, honor your leadership, and assist you that together we may be faithful church of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. In our church, uh, we lay hands on elders uh, when they're newly elders. There are some who are coming back onto elders that have already been elders, and so don't need that for that to happen. But Lori Reynolds um, is a new elder, and so we will be laying hands on her. And laying hands is a symbolic act whereby the church in every age recognizes particular people for a particular service um, in their call to God's ministry as they live as faithful women and men. And so we ask on the Holy Spirit to confer on them this, uh, this special ministry that they have been called to be a part of. And so, Lori, if you could stand before uh, Pastor Elaine and I. We lay our hands upon you, Lori Reynolds, for this ministry of elders. We ask that the Holy Spirit strengthen you for this ministry in Christ church and equip you with everything good to do God's will. May you receive this spirit so that you might fulfill this office of elder in the name of Jesus Christ, and that you might serve Christ Church faithfully. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, you've called these people to serve you in this household of faith and in the world, which you have entrusted to our care and keeping. Send your Holy Spirit on them that they may serve among us with honor and faithfulness. Help them to be diligent in their duties that your church may prosper in the mission you place before it. May their example prove worthy for all of us to follow as we are united in Christ's ministry to the glory of your name. Amen. All of us here, those who are standing, those who are seated, we're all called to be part of Christ's ministry, not only in this church, but also in the world. But we also know that we have elected these folks to be our leaders. And so I now affirm you, each one of you, in the ministry to which you have been called. May you go and serve faithfully and in the name of Christ. May you go knowing that Christ is always with you wherever you go. And may you go knowing that God has called this church to some amazing ministry of which we are all a part. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>